The text that the message is going to be based on for this morning is Matthew 25, verses 14 to 29, and I'd like to just read that for us. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag of gold went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought another five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I harvest where I do not sow and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags, for whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for all the blessings that you give to us. We thank you for all the resources that you impart, all the wealth of your kingdom that you grant us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would help us to take the faith that we have and put it into action and be good stewards of what we've been given. In Jesus' name, amen. So I thought, uh, I thought and prayed a lot about what I'm supposed to say here this morning. And I thought maybe if you all are wondering, you know, how we kind of got to this point, or at least how I got to this point in terms of leading Trinity um, to bring another church to worship on our campus, I want to just kind of walk you through the journey that God led me on. Hopefully then that will help him lead you on the same journey. Because what we're doing here initially doesn't make much sense. And, and frankly, um, when we first started talking about it, I had some doubts. You know, we're, we're, we're parking on the grass. We're, uh, we got uh, uh, cars everywhere. We got uh, people walking from all sides of the campus. We got two different churches, and, and people come on campus. Which church are you looking for, Trinity or Avenue, and directing them which way? It's just, it's, it doesn't seem like it makes much sense. But I think in order for it to make sense, we have to see this from a kingdom perspective. We have to look at this uh, for what is it doing for the kingdom of God in terms of what we're saying. And um, it is putting our faith into action for the sake of bringing people to Christ. Uh, one thing that's helped sort of alleviate my doubts and uh, helped bring me along in the journey was something our principal said, the principal of our school, uh, A.J. Cluck. Some of you have heard this story, but um, he came to me and he said, do you know who George Wallace is? And I said, I don't know, sounds vaguely familiar. Well, he was running for governor in 1958. And the slogan that he was running on was segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. That was his slogan. Well, we know today that he was on the wrong side of history, right? Yes. He was on the wrong side of what would happen. And what I know as we gather together as the body of Christ is that we're on the right side of history. We know that in heaven there's no segregation between churches, right? We're one body with one Christ, one baptism, with one salvation, with one Savior who was crucified 
died, and resurrected for each and every one of our benefits. So he encouraged me. We're on the right side of history by coming together and worshiping as the body of Christ. Now, I want to just explain something real quick because I want to talk about unity, not uniformity. Unity, not uniformity. Unity means that we recognize that our identity is those who believe in Christ. That's one of the things that I, I worried about um, in, in having Avenue on campus with us at the same time that we were worshiping. Would we lose our identity? We have a, a hundred and, and some years of history here at Trinity on this campus. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people over the years who have, have sacrificed a ton for all of this to be here, um, have invested a lot of themselves so that the, the kingdom of God could grow in this place. And what I was reminded of that our unity is not, our identity is not 400 North Swinton. It is members of the body of Christ. So this, this is the body of Christ, and, and it's awesome to be in and among you. And I want to talk a little bit about the parable, too, because this parable really helped me in my journey um, to get to this place. And the parable goes like this. There was a master, and he was going on a journey, and he had wealth, and he entrusted that wealth to three of his servants. And he, he did an accounting, uh, five bags of gold to the first servant, two bags of gold to the second servant and one bag of gold to the third servant. And he says, you know, take, take my wealth and invest it for the, the benefit of my estate. And so they go, and the, and the first one who has five bags invests it, and return, the return on his money that he gets is five more bags. He doubles his money. So he comes to his master when he returns and says, look, you gave me five bags. I've made five more. The second uh, servant came and, and invested his two bags, and he doubled his money, and he came back to his master and said, look, you gave me two bags, I've made two more. And the third servant, who was given one bag of gold, comes back to his master and says, uh, I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose this for you, so I buried it in a hole, and then when you got back, I dug it up, and, and here you go. Well, did that one bag of gold do his master any good buried in the ground? No, he might as well not even have had it, right? And so he said, you wicked and lazy servant, I'm taking your bag and giving it to the one who's, who's been responsible with, with what they've had. And so this is a parable, right? It's not just a story. Uh, it's actually a metaphor. And so I wanted to kind of unpack the symbolism in it a little bit. But uh, first I want to talk about the, the master was looking for his servants to do just basic principles of investing. You take calculated risks, expecting a return on your investment. He wanted them to take calculated risks so that we could get a return on his investment. So the master then, of course, is the symbol for God and his kingdom. The servants are all those who serve God, including you and I. And the bags of gold then are all the blessings, all the wealth of heaven that he imparts and entrusts to us. What Jesus is asking all of us to do is to take what he has given us and take risks for the benefit of the kingdom. The return on our investment, however, is not more money. It's actually people, faith, those coming to know Christ, those receiving the gifts that we have received because of Christ. You know, we have that faith. We are here to celebrate that faith, but there's a lot of people who aren't here this morning. There's a lot of people who aren't participating in the body of Christ anywhere. What God is calling us to do is to take everything we have, consider it his, consider us managers of what he's given us, and invest it so that his kingdom will grow. So we look to the first two servants in this story who put their faith into action. They put their faith into action. They are our example. They are what God is calling us to do. And then following their example means that we experience the same invitation that they experienced as they came back and they heard the words, well done, good and faithful servant, and the invitation was, come and share in my happiness. Come and share in my happiness. That's the invitation that we experience when we take our faith and put it into action. This parable is calling us to that, 
in order to make dividends for the kingdom of God. So there are two things that are required in order to do that. So if we're the servants, we take all of the, the riches of the kingdom of heaven, all the wealth of heaven that God has given us, and he's telling, it to, telling us to invest it for the sake of growing his kingdom, then there are two things that are required of us. First, count your blessings. That was the first thing they did. The, the master in the, in the parable didn't just throw some money at the guys and say, oh, whatever that is, go out and invest it. He said, no, here's five bags of gold, here's two bags of gold, and here's one bag of gold. So the first thing we're called to do is to count our blessings. And the second then is to take risks with a return on our investment in mind. So let's talk about step number one for a moment. Count your blessings. What are the blessings? What are the wealth of heaven that God imparts to us? It's, it's everything that we are and everything that we have. Everything that we are and everything that we have are resources in the kingdom of God that he has called us to invest in his kingdom. So think of your health. If you can speak and shake somebody's hand, you can accomplish a lot in the kingdom of God. If you can welcome and encourage somebody, if you can pray with somebody, if you can read them a scripture verse, if you can just share with them what God means to you, you can accomplish a lot in the kingdom of God. So our health, our money, all the, the money that God has entrusted to us, our car, our house, our job, our skills and talents, these are all blessings that we should be counting for the sake of using as resources. And we don't just do this on a personal level, we do this on a church level, right? So part of my uh, walk to get me here to this point was to look at our campus, this resource that God has given to us that uh, last week, during this time, this room was empty. And the opportunity to fill it with God's word and with God's people praising him and, and having lives transformed in this space where that wasn't happening before, that's being a good steward of what God has given us. We have eight acres on this campus, and we have our kids on the other side of the campus learning and, and, uh, and praising Jesus right now, and we have cars in every spot. I mean, there were spots that weren't full last week, and now they are. So these are all resources that we can look at and say, how can we use these things to benefit the kingdom of God? And don't forget then that our biggest blessing and most powerful resource is the gospel. That is that we all know that there is not, uh, that everybody here has their own brokenness. Everyone here has their own sin. Nobody here deserves to be here, especially me. And we're here, and, and we're called to enter the throne room of God, to call him our Father, to sing in praise to him, and it's, it's only because of Christ that we just celebrated last week his death and resurrection on the cross, and we know that without that, none of us could be here. None of us are worthy to serve in his kingdom. None of us are, are worthy to receive any wealth or any blessing from him. And so that is our most precious resource, and it is also our most powerful one as we share that truth with others. So that's counting our blessings. Then we need to use those blessings to take risks for the benefit of the kingdom, and taking those risks means getting out of our comfort zone. This is how you know you're doing it right. If you're feeling comfortable, then you should probably take another look at how God is calling you to serve in his kingdom. If you're feeling uncomfortable about all that's happening and all that God's doing, then you're on the right track. So let's talk about how we're going to risk those things that we just counted. Our health. Well, that's just as we talked about our, our voice and our hands to, to offer somebody a hug in the love of Christ, to offer somebody a hand in, in, the, in the love of Christ, to offer somebody uh, a verse. These are, we're taking risks here. We don't know how it's going to be received. To pray with somebody probably scares most of us out loud, right? If you were to pray with somebody out loud, how many of you would be uncomfortable with that? You can, I'll, I'll raise my hand. It's scary, right? It's a risk. We don't know how it's going to be received. We don't know how we're going to be judged. We don't know how we're going to be looked at. But that's exactly what we're called to do to use everything that we have to share the love of Jesus. Money, 
You know, we talked about how those, the bags of gold uh, are more than money, but they also are money. And that is that we've been blessed with whatever finances God has given us, and we are called to reinvest some of that money back into the work that God is doing. He calls us to tithe for the sake of financing the work of Christ. What about our car? We talked about a car. Well, certainly a car is not something you can use in the service of the kingdom of God, right? No. Uh, I know people in our congregation who have, of their, on their own have uh, heard about somebody who lo- wanted to come to church but, but couldn't make it here, and every Sunday they swing by their house and pick them up. So that's, that's a person that's here worshiping God that wouldn't be here if, if they weren't willing to use their car in the service of God. Okay, well, what about house? How can we use our house in the service of God? Well, to open it up for the ministry of God, to open it up for, for people to come and fellowship, for Bible study. And, you know, something that uh, uh, Casey and I both have in common is that we have fostered children and opened up our homes so that a child without a home could have one. You know, we opened up our homes to be considered in the service of God. Our jobs, again, we build relationships with those people we work with every day for the sake of, of giving them what we have. That's our faith in Christ, our skills and our talents. If you don't think whatever skill and talent you have, well, first of all, if you don't think you have a skill or talent, come, if you're Trinity, come talk to me or go talk to Casey because I guarantee I'll find one and I'll put you to work in the church. <laughs> if that's your worry, I'm not skilled or talented, we'll help you with that. Don't worry about it. So that's, that's our personal investment in the kingdom of God. In our church, then, we take our, our campus, our history, our location, our school, our people, and we invest every inch of it in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there's two things, count your blessings and then take risks for the kingdom of God. But I'll tell you, we don't normally get past the first one, counting our blessings. Because once we count them, We don't want to lose them. Once we count them, we don't want to risk them. We want to hold on to them. And this is exactly what the third guy in the parable did, right? Ooh, I have a bag of gold. Well, I don't want to lose it. I know, I'll bury it in the ground where it doesn't do anybody any good at all. He was focused on the wrong thing. Focused on the wrong thing. What he was focused on was protecting what his master gave him when his master called him to invest it. So that's what we're called to do, invest what we have been given. Don't be the third guy. Don't be the third servant. Don't be the one that says, well, if I give of my time, I don't know if I'll have time to do other stuff. If I give of my money, I don't know if I'll ever buy the things that I want. If we we share our campus, that's gonna cause problems. So we're just gonna lock it down, secure it, and make sure nothing happens to it. That's what the third guy says. But instead, put your faith into action. Your most precious resource, the gospel of Jesus Christ, find a way to give it away and give it to others. So let me just share with you uh, Hebrews 11, uh, chapter 1 starts out, Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Here's the the great thing about taking risks in the kingdom of heaven is we already know how it's going to turn out. The great thing about taking risks for the kingdom of God is that we've already seen the end. We've read the end of the book first. The Bible is a spoiler in terms of what happens for eternity. We don't have to wait and find out. We already know God wins. So we can invest knowing that we've already won. We can invest knowing that that God already wins. And and as we talked about then, this is a picture of heaven. There's not going to be a Trinity section and an Avenue section when we get to to the life everlasting, right? In in God's presence, there's not going to be any Lutheran section and and non-denom section. It's just going to be the body of Christ all praising him. And so we get a picture of heaven, and then we can take risks because we know already who will win, and this is our faith in action. And then verse 2 in Hebrews 11 goes on to talk about this is what the ancients were commended for. And then the rest of the chapter is just a list of people who did 
what God is calling us to do. It's a list of people who did what the first two servants in the parable did. And in the list is uh, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, David, Samuel, and it goes on and on. These are our examples of faith and action. These are examples of people who did what God called them to do, who took risks for the kingdom of God, and who were invited to share in their master's happiness. These are the people who heard, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's, that's ours to hear as well. And that's our invitation to come and share in our master's happiness. So um, let me just back up a little bit and talk about uh, fostering uh, for a second. I think that this is a, a value that both of our congregations share. Uh, we have a, a lot of people in both congregations that have opened up their home to these foster kids. And um, I think that as a church, we make the mistake of thinking that this is the, the government's problem. These uh, homeless children are, are their issue, right? But it, it's... It's the church's issue. You know, James said there's, the, the true religion is caring for, for widows and, and orphans. And um, I tell you, at first, uh, we didn't think we had enough room in our house. We have uh, a four biological kids and a three-bedroom condo. And um, we were watching uh, this little girl um, for just one night. Uh, we were just taking her for a night. That was the plan. We weren't uh, planning on, on having her in our home for, for permanent uh, on a permanent basis, and we were taking her upstairs in our house to bed, and she knows our other kids, and, and their pictures were on the wall as we walk up the stairs. Our other, and she knows our kids. She was, she was counting them as she went up. Well, there's David, there's Will, there's Grace, there's Lily, and then she looked at my wife and I and said, where's my picture? <laughs> where's my picture? So, we had to ask ourselves, do we have room on our wall for another picture? <laughs> yeah, <come on. laughs> is, is God calling us to use that extra space on our wall in service to his kingdom? That's a resource that we counted and said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to put another picture up there. So once we, we've counted our blessings as individuals, as a congregation, and we've taken some risks, that we think will bring about wins for the kingdom of God. What return on investment then are we expecting here? I mean, let's get specific in terms of, of as, we, as we pour our hearts and souls into the, the ministry of these congregations, what are we looking for in terms of investment? You know, the, um, the Great Commission is the charge that every church has. Trinity's mission statement is to deliver the saving message of Jesus Christ and to nurture spiritual growth in families. But that really is just a rewording of the Great Commission, the mission statement that Jesus gives us in Matthew. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that I have commanded you. So that's, that's our charge. Um, and that's, that's the return on investment then that we expect, is, is people coming to know Christ, being baptized, and being taught about the faith. That's return on investment that we're looking for here. I and mean, what kind of uh, statement does it make now, as cars drive past here every Sunday morning, that all the spaces are filled up? You know, God's doing something there. There's a curiosity. There's a, there's a draw. And, and frankly, they can come to, to either church and hear the message, right? Hear the gospel. Um, so we're looking for people coming to know Christ. Uh, we're looking for Christ to build his kingdom in us and among us, and we are invited then to share in his happiness. But I, I'll say this. It's going to take everybody. If you are not currently investing the wealth of, uh, and the blessings that God has given you back into the ministry, then I, I want to let you know that we're our ability to share in our master's happiness is, is dependent on all of us answering this call. Because, um, you know, each and every person is, is in these congregations for a reason. You have a, a, a role to play. God has in mind for you to use what he's given you so that people would come to know Christ and, and every single person uh, is important. So let me just share with you real quick 
that um, uh, Pastor Casey's going to talk about these in a little bit, but we have these little cards at different stations around. I think there's four stations. And uh, when we do the offering, we're going to invite you to um, uh, take one of these cards. And if you are, are not currently investing yourself to the extent that you think God is calling you to, uh, what we want you to do is circle which church you're a part of, put your name there, and then list just a way that we can get in contact with you. And then we will call you and say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that you're, uh, you're feeling God is calling you to invest more of yourself in the ministry. Let's figure out how we can do that. So uh, that's coming up a little bit later. Um, then there's the promise. I want to talk about just a little bit more about that promise that we will be invited into the happiness of God. The happiness of God is the blessings that we experience by putting our faith into action. That's, that's, and we don't know what all those happy, that happiness is going to entail. That's the beauty of walking in faith. Uh, God reveals that blessings as we go. Um, and just one of the things that I know he's going to do and that I am really, really looking forward to is that there's, there's a blessing in community. Um, there's a blessing in being around the other people of God. And we're going to experience that blessing to a much greater degree being in closer proximity to one another. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that. I know that um, as, as Avenue people get to know Trinity people and, and vice versa, that you all are going to be a blessing to each other, that there's going to be mutual encouragement and support and love and care that we wouldn't have received otherwise. And I know for a fact that that is going to be part of the happiness that God has in store for us. So uh, let's look forward to that together. And uh, let me offer a prayer. Lord God, we are very excited to, uh, to just be experiencing your happiness and to be in your presence, to be in your blessing. We ask that you would help us to continue to walk in faith and put our faith into action. Work in our hearts to help us to know what that means individually. Help us to know what that means as congregations. Help us to experience those promises that you have for us, those ever-increasing blessings in our lives, and that greater and greater responsibility that you give to those who are faithful, that we know that everything that we do in your name has eternal consequences, has eternal rewards and eternal blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite Pastor Casey up. Here he is. Where's my picture? Wow. That was super powerful. And I am uh, so grateful that you made room for a picture in your home. And Trinity, we are so grateful that you have made room for our picture in your history. In the very next chapter, there's a story that I believe gives us the biblical picture of what is happening here. We'll close with this story. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany, Matthew 26, verse 6, at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment. First of all, Jesus was in the wrong place again. He was at Simon the leper's house, and he was often known for breaking bread and associating with people he should not have, at least according to the religious elites. But Jesus did not pay attention to the religious elites. He did not pay attention to the opinion of men and women who did not understand the kingdom that he was bringing. His heart was so knit to the Father that he always made room for people to belong, no matter where or who they were. So he's at this meal, and this woman comes to him, unexpected, underestimated in that particular context, and she comes to him with an alabaster jar. 
a very expensive jar that would be made with a, uh, in a vase-type setting with a very long neck that would need to be broken in order to pour out the very expensive perfume that was in that particular jar. So the setting is Jesus taking risk. The setting is Jesus taking the kingdom of God to places it had not yet been and inviting others into that journey, some of which who were underestimated, surprised that they were allowed at the table. And their response is that they come and they bring their very best, their alabaster jar, filled with the best ointment, the best perfume that they had. And it says that she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And so she not only came to show Jesus her best, she not only came to show the others her best, she came to break what she had at great personal cost to herself in order not to dab or sprinkle Jesus with it, but to pour it all out on Jesus. Now, not everyone was in favor of this. You have to understand that not, not everyone thought this was a great idea. Verse 8, and when the disciples... Those well-intentioned men who were following Jesus, when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? Why this waste? Why would you do this? This is a radically expensive resource, and you have not invested it wisely, woman. You have come in here uninvited, unexpected, and you have broken your vase in front of all of us and just wasted. You just poured it out on Jesus. For this could have been used and been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. We could have done something really good with it. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For she has done a beautiful thing to me, not for me. The woman didn't serve Jesus. The, wood, the woman wasn't known um, for, for what she gave or, or for how hard she worked or for her dedication. She was known because she took the very best of what God had given her and she poured it out to Jesus. To Jesus. Very intimate and personal. Not just for, but to. You'll always have the poor with you but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for my burial. Today I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And so there's, a, uh, there's an issue here. There was an incident that happened, and, and, and the people didn't necessarily know what to make of it. And I thought Vince did a fantastic job of giving our sermon today and, and, and saying, hey, here, there's a different economy when it comes to kingdom economy and kingdom investments. It's not how the world measures things. There's a different measurement here. And so I got invited in just to simply kind of share our heart. And here's what the Lord told me. Just share my heart. Put your notes away. You got 10 minutes so you could never preach in 10 minutes anyways. You know this, Avenue Church. So just tell them what I'm telling you and get out of the way. So here's what I need to tell you, and I'm just going to go ahead and get out of the way. Jesus said, it's not wasteful. It's worship. It's worship. When you take the best of who you are, and at great sacrifice and high cost to yourself, break it and pour it out, going all in to the person of Jesus, not just for, but to, in a very intimate way. Jesus never looks at that and says, what about the parking? 
He never looks at that and says, well, well what about the differences in the, in the ways that things are expressed? And he never says, well, what about if, if you might lose this and, and, and there might be confusion? He never says, wait, 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 we've got to figure this thing out. It doesn't make all the sense in the world. What Jesus says is yes, Trinity Lutheran. Yes, Avenue Church. You break your alabaster jars and you pour yourself out over and over and over again. And the scent of what's going on here this morning and for years to come will not only compel our children and us, but the city of Delray and the watching world. So in response, the team's coming and you see tables and um, places for offering and here's what we want to do. The best way to respond to this invitation of Jesus to bring your alabaster jar is to say, yes, I want to be a part of that story. I want to bring the best of me. I want to see it broken. I want to see it poured out and just get all over the people of God, both who know Jesus and are yet to know him. I mean, I got to be a part of that story. I've got to be a part of what's going on in that campus. And so we have some response cards for you, and they're real simple. It just says, I want to serve. You don't even have to know where you want to serve. You don't even need to know where you need to break your alabaster jar. You just need to know, I've got one. It smells really good, and I want to break it. That's all you need to know. And so when we play, we're going to play here, um, two things are going to happen. There's, there's a table there, table there, table there, and a table there. We're going to ask that you would respond, both in your card, by simply giving us your name and an email or phone number and, and, and circling kind of where, who, who are you attached to at this point? Are you with Avenue? Are you with Trinity? Let us know and we'll follow up with you because what you're letting us know is that I want to, I want to, I want in on this worship. I want to, to Jesus, pour out the best of me because I know, I know that the resurrected Christ as he, his John 17 prayer is answered, will call many to himself, and I've got to be a part of that. You'll see an offering plate. This will also be a time where that serves as the offering. And so, as is tradition at Trinity, uh, a weekly offering happens. The Avenue, we have more of our giving that happens online and things like that, not necessarily as a Sunday. And so we kind of thought, well, what are we going to do with the offering? We need to, we're going to take one and we don't normally pass the plate. They and, and here's just what I feel like the Lord gave us. Uh, any of the offerings that come in today are going to go to support the kingdom mindset that we are experiencing here at Trinity. So it's all going to go to Trinity. It's our idea, okay? It's not Trinity's like sort of saying, hey, well, this would be a real good thing for you to, you know, start off the relationship with. <laughs> this is us saying, hey, you guys got a big old alabaster jar. We got a small one, but we can break it today for you. Okay? So that's what this is about. So the song's going to play, and you'll be invited when you're ready to come and put your card in, put your offering in, and... Uh, and, uh, and we'll, we'll close in worship. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this moment. We ask that you would fill us with your spirit, the same spirit that brought that woman unexpectedly and surprisingly in with the best of what she had to offer it to you in worship. And it did what you told me this day and this moment would do. It just pleased your heart. Help us to worship in the same way, Christ in your name, amen. So Trinity ends our worship with, uh, with two things every service. One, we, we pray the prayer that our Lord has given us when Jesus' disciples said, how should we pray? 
he told them. So that's, uh, that's how we pray together. And then uh, we also end with a blessing. And then we're going to uh, shoot the end of a video we've been working on. That moment. It's okay. Not doing that? Nope. Okay, never mind. Uh, and then uh, Pastor Casey is going to do a meal prayer for us because we've got lunch and fun waiting for us afterwards. So but let's, uh, let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. All right. So, hey, real brief instructions. We have an amazing buffet for you guys. So we're going to ask. Um, we'll pray for the food here in just a minute. We'll go out those doors. Oh, we're going to go out those doors. And um, I'm really good at taking instruction, by the way, Trinity. If you ever need to redirect me, I can do that. Um, we're going to go out those doors. And there's going to be, uh, I think, a couple of tables out there. And you will get your food. You can bring it back in here and eat. We've got bounce houses out there. We're going to have music playing. The worship party is going to continue, OK? So you don't want to miss it. Absolutely. You will need to get your kids, though, OK? So they want to come to the party, too. So Kingdom Kids, make sure you get them. I'm going to pray um, over our food. And uh, what we're going to do is just as we ask a blessing on the food, because this has been such a really cool moment, like historic, awesome, beautiful, beautiful. Jesus is saying what they have done is beautiful to me. I just would like to end it. Um, could you just grab a hand next to you? And we'll just hold hands in prayer. Um, and uh, we'll do it like this, just as like the family of God would do it. Yeah, so let's pray. Father, as we actually physically touch those around us, we know that you have sent your spirit and touched us in a most beautiful way today. And Lord, it just, it feels right and good to be in this context and to be worshiping you as Pastor Vince called us to. One Lord, one baptism, one Savior, Jesus. And so we thank you for this moment. We thank you that in your word, it says that you will show your manifold wisdom to the heavenly beings. And we're believing that there are heavenly beings who are watching and glorifying you, Jesus, because of today. Would you fill us with your spirit, bless the food we're about to eat, and allow us to continue in this posture of family and worship. We pray these things in the name of Christ and all of God's people said, amen.